watching the protesters, watching the protesters globally, from Great Britain to Germany, to Sw- I mean, it was France, everywhere, people packed in. Black Lives Matter Boulevard, packed down with people <laughs> in D.C. What were you thinking? What? What was I thinking? What? All right, so A, I was like, Man, I need to get out there. This is the first thing I was thinking. Like, I like this is this is my time, my generation, right? This is my time to be involved. And then B, I was like, but if I go out there, I then expose myself. I see patients all day. I can't become a vector. So I felt a little bit. You, you know, can't become a vector, a meaning bit, you can't uh, be a person exposing other people as well. Other people, because I see patients all day long, right? I go out there and become a carrier and then go see people. And then we find out everyone has come see me. You know, I'm the person to do it. I can't right. afford You're to do that to people. Patient zero, so, right. Yeah, exactly. So I can avoid. So I, I, you know, I was a little heartbreaking that I, I couldn't participate. I had a conversation with a good friend of mine who went to the Million Man March back in 95, I think it was. nice, And I was a rookie with the Bills back then, and I didn't go. I missed out on that. And I lamented, like, man, I wish I would have had the chance to go to that. And then here we are. So I did some other things. I donated money. You know, I drove by the protesters in Miami, uh, gave them a shout-out, <laughs> all that good stuff. But I thought it was it was something spectacular to watch from – uh, from the from the standpoint of this is stuff that we see happening in other nations when things have gotten so bad that the people basically rose up. I mean, this is like a, a literal uprising, right? They were, you know, marching on the quote-unquote presidential palace. They literally went nothing on the presidential palace, and he had to, you know, barricade himself in to protect himself from the from the, from the from the people, which I was like. Do you realize this is actually how people have talked about this from a, for a long period of time? And I also felt, and this is going to sound really funny, right? Because, you know, as a black man in America, right, um, as, a, as an immigrant, as a Haitian, I was born in Haiti, but I grew up in, in America. Um, there's always been this kind of like, oh, American dream, you know, concept. But then there's the reality of, you know, growing up in Flatbush violence, poverty, police brutality, we all know it, and, and kind of feeling that you're separated from that. Like that American dream thing is for a lot of people, but it's not really for you. you know, you're not going to get that full time. And throughout my life, although I've achieved a lot, right, I've always kind of felt as a black man that, you know, I'm not, you know, you guys aren't fully invested in me as much as I am in, right. in you, right? It's like you see the and football, just, but like Charlie Brown, America's Lucy <laughs> snatching it <right>? away. <laughs> snatching at the end. And I'm like, man, and I keep on putting my faith in this. And, uh, you know, I, I watched this and I said to myself, the world was looking to the United States for leadership and they thought it was going to come from our president, but it came from our people, Right. We, you know, we stood out for the world, right? This thing spread worldwide, but it was us that did it. We didn't rely on some patri- you know, patriarchal figure who knows all and who's all better. We decided to, you know, and this is cliche stuff, to be the change that we wanted. We made that happen. And I thought that was extraordinary because oftentimes there are words without action. And this time people were putting it all on the line, literally pulling on. And I, I was like, wow, I, I really want to share this with my kids. I was like, dude, do you, do you guys realize it's happening in your lifetime? You know, I took my youngest to vote for Obama, my oldest to vote for Obama. We stood in line and I was like, dude, you're going to come vote with me because when, I, when you're older, I want you to be able to say, that you were you participated in this kind of universe shattering event. We're electing a black man president of the U.S., and I think we're having another one of those moments now. What you do know. you tell your sons? You have two boys. Um, we're talking with Dr. Hervé yeah. Damas. Uh, what do you tell them about what they're witnessing? What do you tell them? Have they seen the video? Because we haven't really talked since we uh, we talked off mic. Yeah. But have have they seen? No, they haven't. And uh, you know, one is fourteen. See, he just graduated from middle school, and the other one is four. What's funny is the four-year-old, in his, which kind of broke my heart, because he said randomly, 
you know, uh, they're killing black people. Like he just that was that was his thing. He just said that randomly. So he he must have picked that up from the background noise. You know, my 14 year old understands some of what's going on in, you know, like every other black parent who has a kid going to adolescent adolescence, you have to have that talk. So I've had that talk with him two times already about interactions with the police, how to carry yourself. And that breaks my heart. Like I have to have these talks, but I did, I did say to him, this is why we had those talks. Right. Like those times I had those talks and you were like, what is this guy talking about right here? Right. So this is why we have those talks, because this is a reality that you're, you're not aware of. And this is what people are, are fighting for, you know. And, yeah, he lives a little better life, life than I did. You know, he, he did. He, he's not growing up in a, you know, apartment in yeah. Flatbush. No, he's got a <laughs> kayak. <laughs> you know, that dude's <laughs> like, dude. So he's insulated from some of that stuff. But you know the reality is, you're no matter who you are here, you're not completely insulated. It doesn't matter what your parents do or how much money you make. You come across a certain sect of the population, they dislike you for the color of your skin and what that represents. And that goes to something deeper within them. You know, realistically, I think it goes in something really deep within that. The hatred is, is within them of themselves and what they represent. And they project it onto us. Um, all right, Doctor Doctor Damas. You know, as a as a black man, NFL former NFL player, who now is an MD. You know, have you ever had? Because you know, you're a big black man in America. Yeah. You know, threatening looking. You know, you know all of the stereotypes. Have you had an encounter that that I've had tons, man. <laughs> like if I could tell you, if I could tell. You. With the police, I've had encounters with the police. You know, uh, uh, fortunate for, for me, they've never ended in violence. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of yelling and screaming, intimidation and threats, things like that. I've had uh, interactions with employers, you know, ra- racial inter- I've had some bad encounters. I've had, you know, you see a bunch of football players now talking about what's happened on campus. My first year in college, if I, you know, <laughs> if I was to tell that story, that was, I was like a revolutionary on campus because I was not trying to hear it. What school did you go to? Whatsoever with these guys. Huh? What school did you go to? So my freshman year, I went to a school called Lehigh University. Oh, Bethlehem, like Canada, Pennsylvania? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Ho- Hoity Toity School is an engineering school, you know. Uh, elite Northeast school. I went there for engineering program, uh, but I really went there, uh, you know, for football. I didn't go to the Air Force Academy for dumb reasons, and I wound up going to Lehigh. And they were not ready for somebody who's from, I guess, the inner city, urban, the quote unquote urban youth. Like I was an urban youth. You took me out of Brooklyn, you sent me to this place in Pennsylvania. And, you know, the things that they said and did out there just rubbed me the wrong way. And coming from an environment, you know, which yeah, fortunately I grew up in that environment in Flatbush, which made you kind of a little harsh around the edges. It wasn't it wasn't a familiar position for me to be in to have to take people's stuff, right, to be disrespected. But the other thing were just some of the things were just so – I mean, there was one point – these guys would say <laughs> – there was one time, I'll tell you one quick story, and then I'll get over. We were playing, I was like a freshman, we were playing some other team that had a two-quarterback system. They had like a, a white quarterback and a black quarterback. And the, the coaches come in, and they're talking about the quarterbacks, and he's like, they got one guy, and he throws the ball. He'll throw it around, but then they'll bring that other guy. He's a running fool. He's like a he call he used like a word. I wish I didn't grow up in like the areas that use those kind of words, you know. But he's like a you know basically he used the term that everyone was like. Did he just describe the black guy as like some kind of like you know critter? You know, he's a running fool. And then the other thing, then a few weeks later, they had like you know a quarterback from another team and they were like hanging them from the goalposts and, and i don't know what they were doing and, and i was just like whoa 
Yeah. I, wow. And I was just like, whoa, this is out of control. I can't be a part of this whatsoever. Like, so that was a horrible experience. I wound up transferring from there. Um, you know, the football experience has been tough for a lot of guys. Let's really talk about that a little bit. Um, DeAndre Hopkins and Deshaun Watson urged Clemson to remove John C. Calhoun's name from from honors from their uh, honors college there. Uh, they put out an Instagram. They, they're urging Clemson uh, and the alumni to join. They said now is the time for change. Calhoun was the vice president under John Quincy Adams, outspoken white supremacist. Of course, he advocated yeah. for uh, slavery, and they were like, remove that. We just saw Roger Goodell last week apologize and this whole vi- all right you were in the nfl Hervé, what what are your thoughts on roger goodell and the nfl apologizing for their stance on the knee during the national anthem and now by the way people can take the knee uh they can do what they want during the national anthem that that policy has been uh reversed and uh i think the women's soccer team they're they're calling for the uh, U.S. Soccer Federation to repeal kneeling for the national anthem, which has been something that they're doing. And um, there's change. Do you think it's permanent change? Are you op- optimistic? Where where do you sit on this? I'm not. I'm not. I tell you the truth. It's the Charlie Brown and the Snoopy thing. I think that uh, a lot of this is not leading from the front. It's leading from the back. Right. So when you had the opportunity four years ago to say, hey, this is our lead, this is what we were. The interesting thing about the Kaepernick thing is that that is fundamentally, if you really believe in the American, you know, experiment and what it stands for, what he did was something that they tell you you should be able to do in America. Right. You can express yourself. You can peacefully protest your dissent. We encourage that in America. This is what makes us great. And again, this is kind of like, as a black man, I'm watching this, okay, it's great for all of you guys. Like, you can do that, but for me, when I try to do that, it's not a good look. So the NFL had an opportunity to leave from the front four years ago, and they didn't do that. They didn't embrace one of their players. They didn't embrace American ideology. They went on the other kind of you know, far right, uh, they changed the conversation to a a disrespecting the flag thing, right? And now, four years later, when when the people, again, right, when we as a people, brown, black, Native American, Hispanic, Asian, whoever it was, everyone had enough. And I think not only, it's not only the the police violence, but, but there's a component of the financial disparity in this world when people watch, you know, got $1,200 and they watch companies get billions and billions of dollars. And they're just like, what is, you know, and then you got this guy, I think it was the culmination of all of that that led to this. And then here you come NFL on the back end after your players. And you know, the story behind that one of the players had to get together, like in the, under the you know, cover of darkness with a rogue, like social media in turn or something and make a video in order to make this happen. So when you see that it took all of that to make that happen, I don't, I don't believe that it's genuine. You know, I really don't. When you see the setup this past year, when they had this young man go out there for this workout and it was a dog and pony show and they did all of that, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't serious. Nobody does workouts like that. That's not a typical thing. And so now you want to show up. I'm not giving you any props for that. I'm sorry. Like, wow. And then realistically, I stopped. I had be, I'd stopped really watching pro football after that. You know, I watched some games, but I was not like, oh, I got to watch the games on Sunday. It had left a bad taste in my mouth. What about Drew, Drew Brees? Drew Brees is a buffoon. Um, and I tell you this, like if he was – when I was with the Bills, I was only with the Bills for one year. We had a lot of veterans, you know, Hall of Famers, Bruce Smith, Jim Kelly, Andre mm-hmm. Thermodot, right? Had a lot of, like, these were grown men. I was a kid. I was 21, 22, and they carried themselves a certain way. There was, like, a certain kind of, like, you knew who those guys were, right? And so um, before anybody spoke of when I was with them, and I guess this is why they had so much sustained success, it was before anybody, no one did anything out of, out of whack or out of line. There was a great amount of communication, cohesion in that unit. For Drew Brees to come out, I think, and I think for anybody to be part of any organization and be the face of it, you know, a leadership 
and 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 speak because now you are the face of the the saint and you are one of the primary faces of the NFL and you speak without ever having spoken to the people that you're with every day about this shows the level of disregard to this, right? So maybe he was sitting there and saying, oh, this is just them acting up again, uh, whatever, I'm going to put out a statement because I like my Wrangler jeans, or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever uh, co- contract he's got. But you shouldn't have done that. I think, you know, let's say, I, 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 you know, there was a, a situation with the Me Too movement and I was the face of an organization. If it was important for me to speak out about, I should have spoken to some people within the organization that were personally involved in that and said, hey, I heard this is going on. I don't know much about it. Can you, you know, like, bring let me, let me to talk speed. to you about yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Bring, bring us to me. I don't just go out and say, hey, man. I don't know what these women are protesting about. We gave them the right to vote 40 years ago. They should, I, I like, I don't get that. So his apology was bogus. Yeah, I, you know, maybe I'm just, I'm just a rogue operative right no, now. No, <laughs> you, like, your finger's on the pulse, Dr. Irving. <laughs>